Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone, and welcome to our uh, post-draft edition of the Rider Rumblings uh, podcast. And uh, with me is, uh, is, of course, Murray McCormick, our venerable uh, football writer. And here's a cameo of my dog. Hi, Candy. There, isn't she adorable? Okay. Uh, with that out of the way, she may she may crash the podcast. She's done this a few times where I've been podcasting and she goes into a face looking frenzy. So I just thought I would forewarn people. She was my best draft pick in a long time. Certainly my best acquisition. Uh, it seems like the riders had a comparably successful day on Tuesday. Um, how would you evaluate what they did? Well, it gives me pause for thought, you might say. <laughs> <laughs> looking uh, I guess more so. the dogs on this one. Yeah, we're, we're going to have some tall tales come out of this story for sure. Anyway, and we'll both be in the doghouse if we don't get going on this pretty darn quickly. Uh, I I look at it, I think they did well. And it's it's always with the caveat that, you know, who knows how you do well in a CFL draft because it's such a crapshoot at the best of time. But I think Nelson Lacombo, I think that was the guy they really needed. I, 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 I kind of predicted in my mind, and I don't know if I told people that they were going to go with Lacombo. I think he was a uh, – Gives them so much versatility and the ability to play uh, cornerback, defensive halfback. He could play safety. He come up in the box and play Sam. He's athletic. He can play special teams. He's kind of a local guy. He's from New Vest, another one. In fact, keeps that sort of local connection going for the second straight year. So a good solid pick, and they needed some depth with that. And I think you look at their second overall pick, second round pick, and Terrell Janna, a good slot receiver. Looking at the videos on YouTube. Good speed, good foot planting, and, and uh, played for a, you know a high caliber program at University of Virginia. So you don't think they really need a receiver, but you can. It's kind of like Owen Sam. You never have enough good Canadian receivers. So he kind of stepped in there and maybe help helps out with that. And after that, you know, then it becomes even a, a bigger crapshoot. I think in the draft that you know they're, they're drafting with guys looking ahead, but. I, I would really have to admit that there's a guy they landed with the uh, the fifth pick, Logan Bandy from the University of Calgary, an offensive lineman, who in my initial draft musing, I had him pick him first because I just thought he was a big guy, could sort of step in that line, add to the offensive line depth. He's not he's only 285, so he get a little bit heavier, but I thought they were they got him in the sixth or in the fifth. Sorry about that. I'm just checking my notes here. So another good pick. You know, a late pick that you know we could show up and help out. I think it goes on along with Charbel de Beer that last year. Charbel de Beer. Charbel de Beer. Sorry, I didn't want to touch his name. Uh, you know, he was a fourth rounder. It's turned out to be a starter. So another a good sort of late round pick that could turn out that way. Uh, you know, there's another guy they, they got. They went a little bit of futures early, which I was surprised with Bruno Labelle, a tight end slash kind of fullback out of Cincinnati, who's signed with the, since with the Arizona Cardinals. And who knows will ever see him? But you know, you can take flyers in those later picks, even though it's already a sick round draft. So overall, are they a better team today? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Who knows if they're with the draft? But I, I, I like I like what I saw with out of Jay, out of uh, Jeremy O'Day. They've gained a lot of flexibility with ratio now with guys that can start that can come in and play, particularly with Lacombo La and uh, uh, Jana. So I don't know, Rob. Do you have any quick thoughts on the draft? I know you've been around. I know you're not, you're not getting away with not saying anything about the draft. <laughs> um, I, I got a few thoughts. First of all, I must apologize for the background noise. I presume it is audible outside my condo. It seems like they are uh, I can hear blowing them. something up. So there's all sorts of beeping and booming. So I do apologize. The dog is sleeping through it, but uh, hope you might be sleeping through this podcast as well. Um, Terrell Jan, I mean, that was a player who had been talked about as a possible first overall pick, and the Rough Riders got him at number 17. Uh, always a good number when I remember Joey Walters. Yeah. But uh, receiver didn't seem to be an area of need, uh, considering that there's there's Braden Lanius. They, they drafted Justin McKinnis mm -hmm. uh, last year as well. Uh, Jake Hardy is is trying to make a comeback. Mitch Picton is part of the equation. So they, they seem to be pretty well stocked at Canadian receivers. But when somebody of Terrell Janna's caliber is available at 17, you have to make that pick. And suddenly you wonder if he's going to leapfrog a lot of people. I, yeah. I think John Hodge of Three Down Nation is already touting him as someone who might have a thousand yard potential. Mm -hmm. And you get that in the second round? Well, that's uh, that's interesting. They once got Rayel Guard in the second round. So uh, 
that that to me really really stands out as a, as a as a steal. You mentioned you mentioned uh, um, of course Logan Bandy, and that's another player who had been excused upon bandied about as a as a higher pick, and they got him in the fifth round. And uh, and addressing the offensive line depth is always crucial when you look at some of the age that they're dealing with, uh, with Brendan Labatt turning 35 this summer and Dan Clark almost 33. So uh, as far as Lacombo. Um, you look at the departure of Cameron Judge, and who was a second overall pick, and and I and I wonder if Nelson Lacombo might figure into the equation really nicely, not necessarily as a linebacker, but as someone who can address the ratio issue that was uh, created with the departure of Cameron Judge to the to the Toronto Argonauts. So uh, I really, uh, I mean, again, we've never seen. I'm the only player in this group I've seen play was is Lacombo, and uh, and uh, it's it's impossible not to be overwhelmed with his skills when you watch him play university football. But uh, you assess this, and you and you hear you, you hear some of the assessments from people who've seen a lot of these players, if not all, if not all of them. And, and how can you not be impressed? You know. You and I avoid cliches like the plague. You know, we've said that thousands and thousands of times. But it really is in this draft, and I got the sense of Jeremy O'Day, best player available. Kind of yeah, like totally, you know, yeah. says, just underlines that. Yeah. So if you, if doesn't regardless where you need him, if he's the best player available, you get him. And I'm, I know it says the Steelers draft to Najee Harris in the NFL draft, not in the Pittsburgh Steelers for, may sound a bit of a tangent, are not much of a running team. Why would they take a running back with their first overall? Your first round pick is because he was the best player available at his position. So you take him and you find space for him. And I think that's what Jeremy has done that in the draft. Because it's it's a weird draft because we still got last year's class still have to come to training camp and still be evaluated. So you've got lots of players there. So you may as well just take and I, I, Jan is not a flyer by any stretch, but get the best player available and see what he can do for you. And who knows if move ahead. Like you know, these kids, this if it's a season one, I'm I'm actually as I said, I've watched his videos and I'm really excited when to see Janet play. And I I've talked to Paul Waldo about uh Lacombo and Paul had incredible things to say about about uh, Nelson. And you know, Paul is was played in the CFL and he's a good guy and he coached him and stuff. So I really think the riders landed two great ones with the first two picks and we'll we'll wait to see what happens with the, the remaining four. Uh one of the other things too, which is an interesting uh Sidebar to this was Jake Burt going first. You know, here's a Regina guy, kind of Regina. Well, you and I, we keep seeing that the guy lived here till he was four and he moves and he still calls Regina his hometown, which is pretty cool. But that I, I was kind of stunned by that one. I didn't think he would be. I don't. I don't know if he's not saying he's a CFL player, but he's kind of that tight end person, big receiver that is used utilized more in the NFL than the CFL doesn't have tight ends. So I'm not quite sure. Where, where Hamilton's going to play him, but at the same token, maybe he was the very best player in the draft. He was at the New England Patriots on their practice roster for a whole season, so he must have some skills. So maybe, you know, the Tiger Cats went the same way with the best player available, and they get this Jake Burke. And it was so funny. You watch the videos online. You can see the whole family celebrating the uh, him getting picked first of all, and Orlando Steinhauer telling him about that. And it was a pretty good moment, and it's a cool story to have a Regina – so-called Regina guy who grew up in Boston who still calls Regina his hometown. So that was a that was a nice surprise and a, a nice way to kick off a draft. I thought oh, that was a uh, a fun way to start things. Well, on Three Down Nation, I think it was John Hodge, maybe Justin Dunk, one of them, perhaps both of them, said that the Rough Riders had been considering Bert at number two yeah. had he uh, not been picked by Hamilton. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I, I'm, can I say I had written a big story on, <laughs> on Mr. Burt for today's paper that I was hoping I wouldn't have to rewrite on quickly on deadline if they had. That fell well. But, yeah, it, it stood very nicely. Thank you. <laughs> because they went with combo. I don't, you know, I, he, I don't know if they, I don't know if they could have gone with him. I don't know if he fits. I don't think he's as good as a pick as as Jana, who can step in and right away play. Do you need like? Except for the tight ends don't play in the CFL. No one uses them anymore, Rob. You know that as well yeah, as I do. Riders picked Bruno LaBelle in yeah. the third round, 20th overall, a tight yeah. end from the University of Cincinnati. So you kind so, of scratch your head and you go, what's going on here with that one? Yeah, but, you know, he sounds they just take a flyer on him and see what happens 
down the road and then maybe go this H back and this, like how often does a fullback even get in a game anymore? Like a couple of plays and they're, they're kind of, and they have, they already have some good ones on the roster. So yeah, I, I would have been cool to have Berger. I think there's a lot of family. There's, there's another a kid. I know, I know I didn't have much of a chance of being drafted was Michael Beaudre who grew up in Regina, but went down to the States to do all his training in football in Orlando and kicked around and, uh, He's, a Canadian quarterback has no chance of being drafted, but that would have been another nice story of a kid with a Regina connection to get drafted or something like that. But this Are is we, reality in a six-round draft, too. What do you make of this tight end thing, though? Like, I, I've wondered for a while that considering that so many teams are going with the the kind of the hybrid defensive back slash linebacker, that a lot of teams are undersized in the box. So suddenly, if you're a coach and you're thinking, okay, if we start using – a tight end or an H back more. Um, can we take advantage of the size disparity? Yeah. And yeah. so suddenly the Hamilton Tiger Cats pick a player who in college was a tight end, and then the Rough Riders in the third round pick a tight end. Uh, a few years ago they picked Anthony Eau Claire, who ended up with a t- with Tampa Bay, I believe, is now with Houston. Uh, he's a tight end. Uh, I just wonder, could could the composition of rosters and the composition of the defensive front seven lend itself? to a bit of a rejuvenation of the tight end because you've got a 240, 250 pounder yeah. uh, in a position where he can crunch defensive backs who are playing linebacker. And uh, could that be a, a way the game is evolving because of the way a defensive coaches are aligning their personnel? I think you've hit on a good point there, Rob. I, I credit you for that. That's a good idea. I think that there is a good idea to take advantage of those smaller guys and get these. And also, Bert said that I can't remember his 40 time, but he can also run. He's not a slow man by any stretch of, any stretch of imagination. So he could come in and be an impactful big slot right off the bat, maybe. And just sort of like, oh, Ray Elgard? Yes, I was just thinking of that. <laughs> when you said taking advantage of the smaller Sams, like imagine Ray Elgard doing an, have an opportunity in these kind of offenses now, you get against these kind of defenses now. It'd be pretty cool to see that. Well, you know, and, and you look at the that, the, the way that Ray could dominate smaller defensive halfbacks and, yeah. and had a very deceptive stride. And and I said the other day, I don't recall to whom, but we might never see a Ray Elgard again, but suddenly, and we won't, I mean, 13,198 yards, I don't think we're going to see a, a bruising Canadian receiver do that. But I just thought that he's just a, he's a kind of an outlier as far as the, you know, contrasting his style to the way that slot, the slot pack slot back position has evolved. But suddenly, if you start using some of these trucks at slot back and give them a running start, yeah, honestly, you know, the, the athleticism that that, that uh, Bert clearly possesses makes you wonder. I mean, give him a running start, and good luck to anybody who dares to get in the way. And uh, I'd just like to see a real guard type player again. It'd I'd be cool. To see- and I think, you know, this one thing Janet is, they, they can maybe go with two Canadian receivers, one on the wide side. And, you know, the options now are, are open to them. They, they, I, I, they, and I, we talked a little about this, but oh, they really addressed, the, they went, with losing Cameron Judge, they wanted to address the ratio and change what they did. So now they have so many different options to, to do with the ratio. You know, they could go, you know, you could go two Canadians on offense and or five Canadians on offense and two America, two on defense. And now all of a sudden, your impactful players are all over the field as Americans. So O'Day has given Jason Shivers and uh, Jason Moss some real options for their Canadian receivers. And they're not going to be more than just, you got to play seven. They're going to be part of the offense and part of the defense. And I think that's going to be exciting. It'll take you back to the, so, you know, you've got to have Canadians are, I hate to say it, they're probably a little cheaper nowadays, not as opposed to the old days that they may help with cap space. So I, I think the the you know it's a, the, there's good depth with the riders. They they still they also have a great secondary. They still have good guys returning, but now you have Lacombo who and maybe uh, you know push things at a, at a cornerback or a safety and see how good things can get. So as I said, are they a better team? We'll see what not what in the future. But I, I think they did a lot of good things in this draft. And of course I say that because what do I know? <laughs> How, many, how do you say they don't? Because it's really hard to predict well, that in the some future. Fast you can plug your nose immediately the, yeah. <laughs> back when. But I think I remember one draft, and I'm trying to remember the writers had only two picks in the draft, and they were so late that we were trying to hype up these two guys. And I can't remember. 
There was the Duke Carmel Augustine draft. One year they picked uh, Curtis Gallick and Usman. They had two first round draft choices. They picked uh, Curtis Gallick and Usman Tunkera in the first round. 1989, they had three first round picks and they drafted Kevin Smelly, Andrew Thomas, and who was the third guy? Donovan Wright. All mm -hmm. of whom became Rough Rider legends as we know. Yes. So uh, um, uh, Ruben Mays was their first round pick in 1986. Yeah. So they've had some, they've had some, you know, some drafts. Uh, Trent Soper in 1981. They've had some drafts blow up in there. Tyson St. James first overall. We can go on and on, but I'm trying uh, to think of the year they took two Rams late. Down as an infamous draft in Rough Rider history. I'm trying to think of the year they took two Rams late. An offensive lineman. I sorry, I shouldn't be up if I can't remember to look that up, but it's just because in my time I've written about <laughs> some pretty young guys trying to make it for us. Why did Terrell Jana fall to 17? That's a good question. That's a very good question. I, I don't know. I just, I didn't, I kind of just watched him drop and drop and drop. And you just, maybe, you know, because it, it goes back to that spot. And I guess the best player available by other teams is, a, is the best player available. That may not be the Riders' best player available. So they kind of have their team so preoccupied with looking for beef that uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe they contributed to it as well. I mean, it's generally offensive linemen, defensive linemen, players of that description are, are teams so preoccupied with picking 300 pounders that that uh, that uh yeah. janice slips slips through you just wonder you know there was talk that hamilton would pick him first overall so if yeah. other teams are going with the best player available well into the second round why wouldn't that that uh compel them to pick terrell janna the right the, the rough riders with the snake format with the draft they were the, they were they had the penultimate pick in the second round and they were still able to get him i was I was absolutely shocked. If they picked him second overall, I don't think anybody would have even blinked. Well, they would, and exactly that. But I, I looking back in hindsight, I still think they, they took the right guy with their second pick. I don't think Lacombe would have made it by the Blue Bombers at the third pick. I think they all saw an impactful defensive special teams player who's going to make a big difference. And probably for a long time, too. One of those guys, you know, probably have to make sure we say that word probably in there. And they move, and now say move on. So now we move on now. Just so that it was kind of fun to live in this sort of uh, a false reality of football for for twelve. We're sports writers. We've been living in a false reality for thirty five years. For how many hours or forty eight hours are we actually kind of put aside the the reality of what's going to happen? Is going to be a season and just sort of approach things as you know back to the to the good old days to two thousand and nineteen when the draft was an idea of getting excited about the season ahead and and what might possibly be going on and not have that other word, look, COVID-19, hanging over our shoulders and bringing you down. So it was, it's been kind of fun to speculate and talk about real football but and talk about football coming back, but we can get to the end. It's, we still don't know. Okay? Things are looking a little better. Vaccinations are making an impact, but it's still a mess in Ontario. Alberta it's still, still a mess here. Hmm? It's still a mess here. Look at these numbers. Yeah. Compare them to May of last year. Um, I think a lot of the assumptions going into the new year was, was was that once the vaccine started rolling out, that we'd see an appreciable decline in numbers, and we really aren't. We haven't. No. And, and there's they're talking about reopening the province. Um, let's yeah, just no. get the numbers under control first, as opposed to creating false hope. That's my political statement for the day, but yeah. it factors into somewhat, uh, I think, a, a growing pessimism on my on my uh, part that. Anything is going to unfold because until they can control this virus, a lot of what we're doing is 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 moot or could be moot. Yep. And uh, um, here we are, first week of May, and I, I you look at these numbers and it's very alarming. And and even though people are being vaccinated so so yep. in such a widespread fashion now, where when is that going to seriously impact the numbers not only here but elsewhere in the country? Ontario is a mess. Alberta is a mess. And between Ontario and Alberta, you've got five in the nine CFL teams. Oh, exactly. Good. So that's it's my agent for the day. But I think well, there, right. there goes all the optimism I had when I woke up this morning, Rob. Thank yeah. you, Robbie Downer. Thanks. There goes. I that my dog is cute. Look, but at he her. is cute. She is a cutie. She's adorable. Cute. So there's that. But now yeah. I've now I've taken myself out of the screen. Am I still on the screen? Yeah. I like so the other thing too is, by the time some of these players mature. Are there even going to be Canadians in the CFL? Well, that's, was this the last CFL draft? You know, will there, how many more CFL drafts will there be if, if this XFL thing becomes an Americanized league? 
that's an interesting thought to ponder as well. But we have to. I think it's let's. I think it's best right now to look at it within the parameters of okay. Let's presume there is a season, even that though that might be a bit of a stretch. And how did they do uh, in this false reality we're trying to portray? And and uh, honestly, we may look back in, in a year or two and think, well, boy, we we were really high on these players who turned into nothing. But I think that's pretty unlikely in this in this case because uh, you just look at the appraisals of, of so many of the players that they've picked. And uh, I don't know how. And I mean, John Hodge again, a three down nation, is, is, is given the Rough Riders overall draft a great a great a grade of A plus. I saw that. Yeah, that was. Uh, and uh, I don't think it's a mark you can question with the first two picks. As I said, the next four and get throw Bandy in there. You know that's pretty good and. Uh, I was trying to avoid even saying his name, Rob, because you, Alan Sima, Simon Kinda, Simon Kinda, another guy that may turn out to be a little bit of a flyer, not a flyer, a dark horse in this draft. That maybe not a he, flyer, but a rider. Sorry, Brad Hall. <laughs> but he, you know, he's a guy. He can, he's a backup defensive. He can be a backup defensive tackle. He's he had a bunch of sacks with Guelph, and he's you know came close to Michael Shea's record from the defensive tackle position. So don't forget, he maybe, you know, that Mac Henry's not getting any younger. He's not, he's still effective, but Mac Henry, you know, they could, they could start two tackles, two Canadian tackles, which would be a stretch with Micah Johnson around. But the, the thing is, and as, as I, my follow story kind of touches upon, the options he's created, O'Day has created through this draft, through free agent savings with Canadians is really good. We're going to see how that turns out. It looks so far, it looks like pretty impressive. What you have to remember, too, is you want to be able to start eight Canadians, not seven. Yes. Yeah. Because if you start seven Canadians and one of them gets hurt, then it's absolute chaos. So you want to give yourself that buffer where yeah. uh, if a Canadian gets hurt, you don't have to remove a starter or start tinkering in order to meet the ratio requirements during a game. So that magic number ideally is eight. Mm -hmm. And this, I think they've really helped themselves get to the number eight here. And it's hard to say like Brett Boyko and uh... – Jeremy O'Day mentioned Brett Boyko could possibly play tackle. That it's not very often. It's getting pretty rare to have a Canadian tackle in the CFL offensive tackle. It's, I think the defensive ends are so quick and so wiry and so speedy that I Canadian Canadian tackles are at a bit of a disadvantage. Everyone goes with Americans. You need but, a Ben Heenan, and that's uh, he's he's become a bit of an outlier. Yeah, that's true. That's a good one. So you know maybe that's kind of Brett Boyko is a little bit older, but maybe he can step in there and help them play. But then, and O'Day, we have to remember that O'Day still has some pretty good American talent on this team. And they're still, you know, they still back in 19 were finished first in the West. They were still in the West final. They still got a, a great quarterback. They got a, some great receivers. You know, they got depth in the defensive backfield along the offensive line. And American linebackers, well, other than Larry Dean, we don't know what's going to happen there yet. I don't think. There's, there's a whole bunch of American names in there. So they could go with three American linebackers. Awesome. And I think, again, Lacombo might give them that luxury. You play him at field corner, and suddenly, okay, does L.J. McRae move move down to, to a linebacker? Yeah. Is Luchez, you say, Luchez, per, Luchez, Luchez pure boy <laughs> a possibility for that uh, position? It's uh, Again, it's uh, that creates so much flexibility, not only the flexibility that Lacombo possesses as a player, but the flexibility that he gives them at other positions by wherever you use him, I think that gives you some luxuries elsewhere. But uh, yes, I have one last point with him. He had a 98-yard punt return, I think, or an interception return for a touchdown. Was that against the Rams, Rob? Would you see what that was? It was against the Rams. Yeah, so the guy's got some speed. That's still pretty good, whatever yeah, happens. Two, two back for touchdowns. And yeah. uh, just a, a tremendous player. Uh, yeah. I you know, I, I did do my scouting there. I saw him firsthand. So <laughs> Even Jeremy Day, yeah, I think the ride, the rider coaches went to watch him play on purpose at Mosaic Stadium one day. Sure. Well, um, i got to take my dog to the vet. Did I mention right. that she's cute? So we be we we better. There's one last peek at her so we can say dog yeah. dom goodbye. Yeah. Who's, who's str she's stretching right now. Isn't she cute? She's a, she does appears to do a lot of sleeping, Rob. I don't know. She, maybe she's, she is uh, <laughs> sleeps roughly 26 hours a day. So That's like the best life you can lead. So uh, if she slept any more, she'd have our jobs. So, yeah. so all right, Rob. It was great chatting with you. Keep working skinny. Keep going exercising and all those good things. And uh, what would our next? Do you want to predict what our next rider rumblings will be? Who knows? Eh? Uh, probably sometime in June when they. Yeah. 
could kind of make a decision as to whether they can adhere to that uh, template that would, would lead to a July opening of training camps and an August 5th uh, commencement of the regular season. So here's hoping we're the uh, subsequent podcasts, we're just talking about uh, the, the business of football and some, some encouraging developments and that my earlier pessimism proves to be proves to be unfounded or my pessimism since I'm talking so much. Well, you, about you knocked all my optimism out of me. You slapped it right out of me. So. I'm a total downer and I do yeah. apologize for that, for puncturing your, your balloon. So yes, the bubble is burst. For Murray McCormick and for Candy, I'm Rob Vanstone. Thank you so much for, uh, for your time today. And we look forward to talking to you uh, soon. Take care and have a great day.